Look in your Bibles at John chapter 2. We're, we're, uh, this is disciple making phase one. You got the, uh, come and see. It's part two. We have one or two other parts to, to look at this. Come and see. It's very simple what he said. And yet there's some, there's some profoundness as you look into it. But, it was, but it, keep it simple. It is simple. John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would, and I'm going to, I'm going to read this. infallible, all-sufficient of God. Well, wouldn't you love to have been there? The first of his signs, the first of seven. John, John writes his gospel account around seven miracles that he calls signs. We'll be looking at some of those in the future. Thank you. Please be seated. We need to, we need to think about how Jesus showed his followers, these, this man that he's putting together, these men who are following him, who, who simply responded to come and see, how he shows them early on to look for the miraculous in the mundane. The miraculous in the mundane. I don't know how many of you remember David Sitton missionary, missionary trainer. Uh, he, he pioneered Blaze Trails in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea. And uh, Mary spent, Mary, you spent a summer in Papua New Guinea, didn't you? Or maybe longer than that even. Papua New Guinea, that, that island which is infamous for missionaries because of so many different dialects that are there. So many different tribal dialects. And when David was with us uh, a few weeks, years ago now, after he had preached our youth conferences, I asked him to come and preach at Bethel. And he told the story about one of his first encounters there when he was, they, were, they were going into a village and uh, they'd been doing some studying. They had enough information together to go and try to communicate with this tribe that had before this never been encountered by the gospel. And so he was undertaking to do that. They were sitting on a log around a fire, the, the uh, leaders of the village. Uh, someone was translating for David. And as he was sharing with them, a couple of things happened. One of the things you remember he told them was as he shared the story of the Creator and the flood, and he was walking, just walking them through Bible storying. Uh, Big tears welled up on one of the chiefs. And he said to them, how long, how long have you known this? Because he had told them the gospel. How long have you known this? And David said, well, we've, this happened 2,000 years ago and the people in the country I come from, have, we, we came to that country knowing this and for hundreds of years. And the chief said, why did it take you so long to come tell us? Something else happened, though. 
You remember? He said, out of the darkness, this, this witch doctor appeared and was just all irate and upset that was talking to these people about a, a spiritual, spirituality that, that they had not learned from the witch doctor. He was very incensed about it. And, and he threw his, his stick down and began to chant, and the stick levitated. It actually came up off the ground. And David's watching this, taking all this in. He said, Bill, I don't know what came over me. But he said, I was just filled with a holy indignation. And I said to him, my God can make that stick stay on the ground. And then it went to the ground. And then we started to begin to chant over it. And work himself up and the stick stayed on the ground. And it got more and more feverish until suddenly out of the darkness came a man with a machete who took a swing at David's head and he ducked and he missed cutting off David's head with a machete. They got up and they ran. The people were protecting him from this fellow. Now fast forward the story and the man who swung the machete became a follower of Jesus and David called him Machete Bob. That was his friend, Machete Bob. And he actually has pictures with him standing next to Machete Bob, holding a machete. And, uh, but he's a follower of Christ, became a brother. But the people told David, in, in all of that acting, he, they said, your God has more power than our gods. We'll follow your God. And for the first time in my life, when David told me that, I, my eyes began to be opened. He said, Bill, he said, blazing the trails of international missions to unreached people groups, we do not win them with our fine arguments. Our arguments don't make much sense to most of them. We win them when they see that our God has more power than their God. Where do you think we live now? Do you think we're going to encounter the typical postmodern uh, deconstructionist, whether it's a young millennial or an older boomer like myself, do you think we're going to win them with our arguments? I tell you, we're not. They've been raised and have been drinking the poison to believe that we believe fairy tales. We believe myths. But you know what will win them? Power. When they see power, now, I don't imagine any of us are going to find ourselves in Owasso or the surrounding area watching someone chant over a divination rod, seeing if it will levitate or not. I don't think that's where we're going to find ourselves yet in, in, our, in our culture, all right? But we do encounter people who need, who need power in their lives. They feel powerless. And we do encounter people with a message and a witness to the power of God. The miracle working God. You know what the first miracle is that the Lord ever worked in my life? He saved me from being religious. Now I promise you, had you known me from the time I was about 10 or 11 or 12 till 20, uh, I, would have, I would have outdone you in terms of religiosity. Man, I, I was all in on religiosity. I've told you before, I, I, I think I still have in one of my little, little, my little boxes of jewelry boxes or whatever you call a man's box that has stuff in it. I've got 100% attendance pins in there from when I was growing up. 100% attendance in Bible study. 100% attendance in choir, youth choir. And I was proud of those. I won the Bible drills at our church. When we had uh, youth week, I was either the youth preacher or the youth song leader. The two highest positions you could get. As, I mean, I was religious, folks. I was very religious. There was one problem. I, I wasn't saved. And the Lord saved me. Now, I don't, I don't know what your story is, but I just want to ask you this. When the Lord saved you, 
Did he give you a token of something tangible, uh, evidential, credible in your life to, to convince you he had saved you? Because see, my, part of my problem was when I was 10, I said I was saved. I said I walked down the aisle, took the preacher's hand, said I want to be saved. He prayed with me right there. He baptized me that night or dipped me. It really wasn't baptism. He just dipped me in water that night. And we went on. So when he really saved me, you see, here's my problem. I was a hypocrite. I was Billy Baptist in that, in that circle of people, around the people at church, around my mom and her friends at church. But I had a really foul mouth. Now, I never would cuss in front of mama. I'd, I'd get... She washed my mouth out with soap one time when I said so it wasn't even a cuss word. I mean, it was just, just a slang term. I never would cuss around mama. <sighs> but I did cuss. When the Lord saved me, He took that away from me immediately. It was a display of power in my life. To, and he doesn't do that for everybody. He doesn't have, but for me, it was because I thought I'd been saved before and now what am I going through now? It was a token to say, I'm doing this. This is real. And I don't know if you've had anything like that in your life and you might want to think about that, but, but think about the first miracle the Lord ever performed in your life. And for me, it was, the, it was the miracle of salvation. I say that. I mean, I've told you about, about how how I believe he rescued me from drowning when I was a child. Because had I drowned at that time, I mean, I would have gone to hell. There's, I was unconverted. Had I died, there's no doubt where I'd have gone. So the Lord betokened me some kindnesses. And you see, folks, we have a story that it took a miracle. And there's a song, and well, if it's in this hymnal, I don't know, that it took a miracle to hang the stars in space. You know the hymn I'm talking about? Is it in our hymnal? It's not in our hymnal. But it talks about the miracles that God did. But then it zeroes in. It's the, the real miracle is when he saved me, when he saved my soul. It took a miracle of love and grace. And we can talk to people who need power in their lives. They need, they need something, they need someone to come and rescue, to deliver. I thought it was interesting that this, this woman that Karen's cultivating when they had that exchange and Karen told her she was grieved to hear that she was having to go back to her home state to go to court for, for, for divorce proceedings that she'd pray for her and the woman said can, can I get a hug? What was in that? That woman, that woman needs something, someone to move on her behalf. She's feeling bewildered. And folks, I'll tell you, we're, we're around people like that all the time. They may not ask for a hug initially, but they want to know that there is hope. You know what I think we're guilty of sometimes? I mean, I have to guard myself about this. Is we're guilty of being very quick to deliver the bad news to, <laughs> to the generation around us, you know? And if you're on Facebook at all, I don't know if you get tired of this, but so-and-so drops a bombshell. This changes everything. Oh, it's just it's, it's sensational. It's just it's ridiculous. But there are people, and that's, that's how they live. They've, they've heard the latest bombshell. They've, they've been rocked by the latest game changer is the popular term now. And we have something that the rest of the world knows nothing about. We have a story of power. I think, look what Jesus did to these disciples. This is fascinating to me. He takes them, they follow him, 
They go to a wedding. Now, weddings were special occasions, but they were, they were commonplace. The Jewish culture celebrated at several points, and one of those points was the celebration of a wedding. These were probably friends of the family. Mary had been invited, but also Jesus is invited. So her, her son and his followers, this, this newly established rabbi and these, these followers of his who are learning from him, this carpenter's son who has now taken up teaching, they were invited as well. It's interesting in this story that when, when, the, when the dilemma presents itself, Mary goes to Jesus. Look at the confidence she has in him. And I wonder, I'll read that and I say, do we have that kind of confidence? In they have no wine. Now, the response throws us off a little bit, but basically what he's saying is, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. He, he, he reads her heart, he reads her mind, he reads her motive. Because behind this, apparently Mary wanted him to get up and grandstand. Out of wine, folks. Fear not. I'll bring the wine. We'll have more wine. He wasn't going to do that. He was going to, he was going to be revealed on his terms at his time. And when you read through the narrative, what you discover is the miracle he performed was not known to the people who attended the wedding. The master of the feast didn't know he performed the miracle. If you read the text, it says, the master of the feast didn't know where the wine had come from. The servants who did his bidding knew where the wine came from. The followers of Jesus knew where the wine came from. He shows them a miracle. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a, it's a miracle that takes place, and he opens his vest and shows his followers. And the servants know it simply because they're involved in the process. But his followers are shown a miracle so that they can see that he can be believed. Here, here's, here's the story for us. When we talk to people, they will hear us. We will get a right to hear, to be heard, and, and a right to speak when they see power in our lives. If, if, if we're living with the same frustrations they have, the same fears they have, the same perplexities they have, the same discouragements they have, then all that misery loves company. They'll be willing to commiserate with us, but they're not necessarily going to stop and take note that there's something different about us. And you see, if we've been saved by grace, there is something different about us. I think sometimes we just we let the culture overtake us. We 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 are among them too much. We've we've fallen guilty of of being in the world and of the world. And the scripture says you're in it, but you're not of it. And so we've got to, we've got to stop and, and learn from Jesus and say, wait a minute, I'm a follower of Jesus. If I had been there, he would have showed me this miracle to, to show to me, you can believe what I tell you. I've got power. I've got power. And boy, would they see it. As the story until unfolds, as the narrative is told us in the four gospel accounts, the things they saw So here's the question I have as we, as we read this. Do you have power? We, we sing there is power, power wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Do we live lives that speak of power? Isn't that all we hear about today? What are, what are we hearing in the whole political discussion? Who has the power? Who has the delegates? Who's going to be able to flex their political muscle? Who's going to win? I mean, isn't that really what consumes this culture? Whether it's who's going to win college basketball, college football, and now the, now the National Basketball Association playoffs have started. Who's going to win? Who's going to show they have the ultimate power? And on and on you play it out. And yet we come with a whole different kind of power. A power to set people free. 
Don't be afraid to tell people when you talk with them that which once held you captive. Paul writes to the Corinthians, if you remember, and he, he makes this list. He says, haven't I told you that, that, that this, this lifestyle and this lifestyle and this lifestyle, that no one who lives this lifestyle will, will inherit the kingdom, you'll not see the kingdom. And then he says this, fascinating, he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed. You see, part of our problem is that we tend to act toward those who are not a part of the church. We tend to act toward them as if we are better than them. And we're not. And if we don't act that way, do you know what many of them think? They think that we think they're, we're better than them. That's, that's just how they think. That's, you've got to know that. They're, they're in the grip of Satan and the devil's a liar and he lies to them, fills their head with lies. And what we need to communicate is, you know, you've seen the bumper sticker, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. We need to communicate, no, we're, we don't, quote, have it all together. What we have is access to a power source that gives us all that we need to live this life now. And to live it with hope, to live it differently than average people live it. Now, here's the secret. Here's the, here's the little secret nobody wants to talk about. One of the reasons we don't want to talk to people about the Lord Jesus is that it will, it will call us to a certain level of accountability, won't it? <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to own up. We'll have to, we'll have to fess up. We'll have to confess sin. We'll have to repent. We'll, we'll have to, see? Because the devil lies to you and me and says, what have you got to share with them? I mean, look at you. Look what you think. Look what you say. Look, look how you act. And there I think's the challenge. So early on, notice what Jesus does. Appreciate this. Early on, he shows them. And Jesus teaches us something here, I think, about people. Here's a quote I, I came across. This. If people we work with perceive that we are not sensitive to needs when they arise around us, they will not want to follow us or dedicate themselves to a common task. If we are program-oriented rather than people-oriented, they will feel used and dispensable. They will see themselves not as viable ministers with value to the body of Christ, but merely as another project. Or, another way to say it is, they will simply see us as interested in them to make them another cog in our wheel, to give us bigger numbers. That's what folks think generally. So that's why they come in with the attitude, what's in it for me? What have you got for me? Because they figure there's something in it for you. And the challenge we have is to follow the example of Jesus, who in the early days, notice what he did, simply invited them, come and follow, come see. Come see where I, where I live, see where I, where I labor, see how I love. And then early on said, I want you to see what you can, what you can count on from me. There was a real need at that wedding. And Jesus met the need on his own terms. Almost, almost secretly. Almost secretly. Yet he met it. And he would call us, I think, as his followers to say, you want to you come and see? Come see this. And then challenge us with, what do you see? What do you see around you? Because you, know, you say, well, I don't... Pastor, I don't know how I can perform a miracle in front of people. Do you know what one of the miracles is that you can show people? Unconditional love. You say, well, how is that a miracle? Because the only way you can show somebody unconditional love is if you've been a recipient of the miraculous grace of God. That's the only people that can show it. Other than that, you're going to love with a motive. I love you as long as you love me. 
I love you because I enjoy being around you. I love you because of what I think I can get out of you. No, unconditional love says I love you. Whether I ever personally see any benefit that accrues to me or not, that's not, I love you. I love you. That's a miracle. And if you don't appreciate it, just go and love a stranger that way. Go and love these folks you're talking to about, come go to church with me. Because they don't find it anywhere. They don't go find that in the world. The world doesn't even try to imitate unconditional love. Because it can't. It's a unique property of Christians. It is an expression of a miraculous work of God. Don't discount that. You don't have to make sticks levitate or stay on the ground. You can simply love people in a way that nobody else loves them. And when you do that, you know what they see? They see power. Power. A source of power that doesn't come up at any other time in their lives. We love them to serve them. Think about our, our church uh, statement. We want to follow Christ. We want to love God. The first commandment. The first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart. We want to love others. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. We want to serve the world. You get that? You see the follow Christ, love God. And if you do, a, a heart flows out to love others with that agape, unconditional love. And when you love others, you're going to be put in the position of serving. You're going, to, you're going to stoop to serve. You're going to serve the world. And I promise you, folks, that is miraculous today. And we, the church of Jesus Christ, the blood-bought sons and daughters of the living God, we're the only ones who can show that to the world. Nobody else does. Nobody else can. We are uniquely equipped for that. So Jesus, early on, John says, performed this sign to introduce his followers to his power and promise them along the way, you will do greater things than you've seen me do. And we can. Come see. So maybe, maybe as we think about the challenge we've given one another to, to invite folks, just come and see. Come and see where I worship. Come and see where, where we attend church. Come and, come and see. Come into my life. Maybe we need to add to that. Come and see. They get close enough that we can love them. Now, I haven't been in all the conversations, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to guess that the lady Karen in, engaged felt some kind of love from her, that she would want a hug from her. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Can I get a hug? What a mercy of the Lord. That means for somebody like me, that's not much of a hugger, I need to be ready to do that. I need to be ready to show power. And if folks know me, they'll know, wow, that took the power of God for that hug. Let's pray. Oh, God. Hmm. Dear Holy Father, we, we thank you for Jesus Christ. Certainly, certainly for his, for his sacrificial death, dying in our place, bearing in his body our sin on the tree, absorbing your divine wrath for our sin, taking it upon himself and satisfying your divine justice by suffering and dying in our place. We rejoice that he rose three days later. 
to show infallibly that what he said he was going to do on the cross, he had done, and that you were satisfied, and now he would make a way to God for all who would have faith in him. We thank you for the gospel. Lord, we also realize that, that there was a span of three to three and a half years that he lived, and oh, what he showed. Oh, what he taught. Every lesson intentional. And the disciples who didn't seem to get it, ultimately, in the fullness of time, demonstrated that they all got it. The 11 who survived all ended up giving their lives for Jesus Christ. Most of them to martyrdom. John to exile. They loved. And the way they lived was a miracle. And Father, we know that you saved us to make us miracle workers, to, walk, to be walking miracles. Help us never hesitate to explain to people when, that, that we're, we're not perfect. We're, we're, we're forgiven. We're cleansed. We're, we're not what we were. We, at one time, we were those things but we were washed. We were changed. The miracle of grace. The miracle of the new birth. God, help us so to live in front of others that they see a walking miracle. And then help us to, to love them and speak to them about the power of the gospel in such a way that we could say with Paul, we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who will receive it. Our Lord pulled back his veil for just a moment to let the disciples see his miracle power. And they believed him. They were put in a position to believe what he taught them. To hang on his word because he backed it up with action. We want lives like that, Lord. We want lives that speak before people in such a way that, that, that actions speak louder than words, that people will be open and receptive to the words we have to share because of the actions that we've taken toward them and in their presence. So bless us, Lord, as disciples who want to be disciple makers, who want to, to make disciples who will themselves become disciple makers because we know that that is your ordained way to grow your church and to advance your kingdom. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing.